What's going on guys? This is Jim here with Unplayable and I have a deck tech for you with one of my favorite decks that I've been playing here with set to Shadows of the Galaxy for Star Wars Unlimited. Now, this deck has my favorite leader from set one, good old Luke Skywalker. So as the set was coming out, I was trying to think through like, okay, what are some of the leaders from set one that might have a few different things that could come into play for this new set to really kind of take it to the next level. I think Luke actually got a lot more tools than people are talking about. And so just wanted to kind of talk through this new deck list that I have. It's kind of a take on the just Luke ramp green energy conversion lab style of play with some key cards added to the list that I think really just elevates this deck. And so that's kind of where I wanted to start with this new idea is like, what would it look like for a new Luke green deck to form? And as some of these cards are starting to come out, there's two cards in particular that I felt really might shine in this deck list. One of the things I always talk about when a new set comes out or the card pool starts expanding, I think usually early on in a game, in the first set in particular, you can look to see what is just the thing that does the best value at its cost and kind of throw all of those things into a deck and you'll get a lot of victories that way. Said Fast Battalion is a great example of that with an energy conversion lab deck. Nothing else at five cost was coming down for 7-7 with ambush and could overwhelm. It was just insane value at five resources. I think as the game continues to grow and you're looking to build competitive deck lists, you really need to start looking for what are some things that just feel unfair? What are those things like you are force throwing your opponent's you know, seven cost unit, getting that out of their hand, destroying their giant unit on board and just winning the game that way for one resource, that feels unfair. And the two cards that I saw during the spoilers that really started getting some gears turning was Maz Kanata and Rose Tico. So Maz is a one cost uh, command, heroism unit. It's a one one, which is like the worst possible stats ever. But it says when you play another unit, give an experience token to this unit. So one thing Luke's always been doing is you play your Alliance Dispatcher on turn one for one, you give it a shield, the next turn you use its action ability to play a four cost unit and start getting some ramp going that way. So Luke already has a history of being able to utilize one cost really well. And what I've noticed is when you play this one cost one one give it a shield most of your opponents won't think twice about it it's such a small unit they'll find a way later on in the game to just take it out eventually and it's better just to not worry about it kind of like crafty smuggler coming down as a two cost two two with the shield usually you expect your opponent to be trading in with that crafty smuggler rather than you dealing or taking two attack actions to kill it. And so with Maz, it's a crafty smuggler, but basically the first action on turn two when you play your second unit. So I've just won so many games because they just don't respect Maz Kanata, come down as a one one, all of a sudden, you know, your leader's coming out and it's a five five, you're giving it more shields and it's just snowballing the game like crazy. And then it gets to game two of that best of three. And now all of a sudden their first action on turn one is using their open fire to try to get rid of this Maz Kanata before you're able to really start going crazy with it. That's a great trait. You just traded a three resource thing for a one resource thing early game. You're gonna have so much tempo moving forward. So Maz Kanata was the first one I wanted to add to this list. Second one being Rose Tico. So Rose is a four cost two six shielded unit, which says on attack, you may defeat a shield token on a friendly unit. If you do give that unit two experience tokens. And so what I realized with Energy Conversion Lab is Rose Tico can actually just ambush in and use the on attack ability on her own shield. So you play it, you give it the shield, and then you ambush it in. It's now coming in as a four eight with ambush for four resources. That is insane value. So many of their early game plays just cannot hold up to that. And now you just have a giant unit ready to roll. So it's already got a ton of health. It's just taken out one of their units. If you do this play on the five resource turn, you can just immediately use Luke to give another shield back to Rose and start the train all over again. Because next turn Luke is coming out and can just give more shields. So you can really start buffing this unit up quickly. As well as there's just so many ways that like Luke is giving out shields to your other units. You don't have to use it on Rose. You can take away any shield and give that unit plus two plus two if that's more advantageous for you. So it just gives you a lot of options, a lot of ways to really feel like you are taking over the board state because of Rose coming down. 
So that's where I wanted to start with this deck building plan for those two cards coming out in Shadows of the Galaxy. The first thing I noticed though was neither of these two cards are Rebel Synergy. There's still a lot of great Rebels in this deck, but you'll notice there's not those Fleet Lieutenants, there's not the Wing Leaders, there's not the Mon Mothmas to try to bring back those Rebel units, because it's just not as consistent. I really wanna make sure if I'm going the Rebel Synergy route that I'm really maximizing those synergies. And so this actually freed up my deck building a whole lot because it was now just what are going to be the best things that I can put into this deck that have the most value while a few key items are doing the broken things in this deck. So first up, just want to talk about some turn one plays. As we kind of go through this deck list, I'm going to go through the whole list. It's kind of some of the early game leading to the late game. We'll talk about some of the sideboard options, a few of the gameplay strategies against just the key archetypes that you're going to be playing against. And then lastly, we'll just talk about some other inclusions that you can consider for your list. So to start with, we're just gonna go with some turn one plays. First up, we just have the Alliance Dispatcher. This was just such a staple in uh, Loot Green Ramp list from set one. I moved it down to two copies of this unit for set two because I really think Maz Kanata is where you're wanting to build up that board state. Alliance Dispatcher is still great. There's still plenty of times where I'll play Maz and then play the Alliance Dispatcher to already have two units on board and really start some stuff going strong. But I'm less excited to play the Dispatcher in this version of my list than I am for Maz Kanata. So just to make sure I don't totally flood my deck list with way too many early plays, I just bumped that down to two. But still a fantastic opportunity to play the Alliance Dispatcher, go ahead and shield it up with Luke, try to play one of your four cost units on turn two. Still a great play. Highly recommend it. We've already talked about Maz Kanata, but it is an absolute tank in this deck list. And one of my favorite cards in the new set and really just trust me when you play this deck, you will see just how powerful this card can be. We also have the Battlefield Marine as just an absolute tank of a unit. A 3-3 three, three for two is just great stats. I think eventually as the game continues to progress, we get more play sets, just vanilla cards like this won't be able to see as much play because you need them to be able to do things. But as of this point of the game, a 3-3 three, three for two is still fantastic. There have been so many games where I'll actually just ECL the Battlefield Marine to kill their 2-3 unit to start off the game. If they're playing a Sabine down and they're trying to go really fast, a 3-3 three, three clearing their board is everything you could ever want. So still love this card, still think it absolutely should be a three of in this deck list. Last one for the ground units is gonna be Quill. Quill has been an interesting pick, but I still think it has a lot of value in this deck. So it's only has two versions or two copies of this unit. Reasoning is the stats aren't amazing. Two, three on the ground. There's a lot of things that can kill that really early. However, the restore one is great. You're wanting to restore well. Against a lot of the very aggressive lists, Luke's ability to play units that are restoring, keeping that health total very healthy for you, so you're not really worried about those for a cause I believe in plays coming down, is how you win the game. You can eventually win the board over from those aggressive lists. Quill helps you just kind of prolong the game a little bit more to where if they really want to destroy this, they're now wasting an entire attack to do so. So the restore one is the reason I'm playing Quill in this deck list. It's on attack ability isn't nothing though. I think it actually has a lot of value. So it says on attack, discard a card from your deck. If it shares an aspect with your base, return that card to your hand. So roughly half of this deck is green, is command cards. And so if you do flip over a command card, you just get to draw it. I'd like to treat this ability similar to like the Greedo when defeated effect, where if it hits, you're very happy, feeling great. Just do not rely on this as a consistent draw engine. If you are saying, I need this quill to hit to try to win this game or to have any opportunity to win this game, you've probably made some more mistakes along the way. But when it does hit, you're feeling great. It's great at drawing the ramp events that we'll talk about a little bit later. It's great at drawing a lot of those early units as well to kind of help recycle that hand, get a lot of units on board. So I still think it has a lot of value. I think if you were looking for cards to cut though, this might be where I start. Lastly for the tournament plays is just the space unit, just the restored arc, um, just such a classic, just early game play. Two, three in space is fine for stats. You're really looking for three attack as much as you can, but restore one on turn one is fantastic against those aggressive lists to really stabilize that board. And the two, three stats as well kills those lurking tie phantoms, which are going to be everywhere, which is that two, two yellow villain unit that'll be coming out. This card can just get rid of it, take it down immediately. Don't have to think twice about it. So still has a lot of value. It's just not going to completely win you the game on the space side of things, but restore one still really solid. Next up, we're going to move to some three cost units. And I don't want 
want to just say turn two plays, turn three plays, etc., etc. The reason I love Luke so much in these style of decks is that you always have a lot of options available to you. And I typically think if you can maximize each turn and tailor it to what your opponent trying to do and being able to stop that, that's really how you're gonna win this game. I think a lot of play styles can just be, okay, you play this card in turn one, this card in turn two, this card in turn three, flip your leader, so on and so forth. And it just becomes so rigid and routine that A, you get bored playing the deck, but B, it's very easy to counter because your opponent knows exactly what you're gonna be trying to do. When I see a red ray list get to that four resource turn, I know pillage is probably coming. So let me go ahead and play out my unit that is going to hurt me the most if it's out of my hand. Those are the kind of plays that I think are really helpful in a deck like this. But three cost units here. I'm gonna start with the ground units. We have three copies of Echo Base Defender. It is a rebel. It's just fantastic stats with Sentinel. This deck just wants to get to the late game. Big stats on a Sentinel unit this early on in the game really helps get you to that late game side of things. As well as just a fantastic card with U-Wing reinforcement, which we'll talk about a little bit later. I just think that unit in particular, you can pair it with so many other three drops, also with Moscanada to get some buffs um, on that unit as well. It can just save you the game immediately, just having Sentinel in the play. We also have Yoda in here. Yoda is another unit that might seem a little bit strange because there's not a ton of force synergy with this deck. However, Restore 2 on a unit is crazy. Pretty much anytime your opponent's trying to be the aggressor, they have to deal with Yoda. If they do deal with Yoda, you can now draw a card, um, which is giving you more options as you're gonna continue the game state. There are forces with me plays in this deck to make this a 4-6 with the shield and to get to attack. But yeah, just that Restore 2 is really just so sick. I'm a big fan of Yoda in this list, even though there's not a ton of force synergies in this deck list, I think there's enough that it's still worthwhile and 2-4, is still fine for what you're trying to do here. Lastly in space, it's one of my favorite cards in this list from the newest set. It's the Concord Dawn Interceptors. So this is a one four Sentinel unit for three, but it says this unit gets plus two zero while defending. So when you play this card on the space side of things, especially against space heavy deck lists, a lot of them are attacking for three, typically with three or less health. And so this card can very quickly destroy two units, sometimes even more, especially if you're able to shield this up. It has the potential to completely shut down the space side for some of your opponent's lists. I run two copies for my deck list here. You could definitely consider running three. Um, I'll talk about Bright Hope in a little bit and why I'm running two and two rather than like three and one or a few more options there. But I think two is at least a good starting point because it's not one that you're really wanting to use to attack into their base for only one. It just stalls out that space side to help you get to that late game and take over the game that way. All right, for our four costs, we have a couple classics in here. Kanan is just such a staple in Blue Hero. The four or five stat line is fantastic. On attack, discard one of their cards and heal up a little bit. So it has restore, sort of, already on the card text. This is one that I'm totally fine to ECL in. It's not one that has the most upside if I'm using Energy Conversion Lab with this card, but just to clear out one of their units, get to heal up a little bit, usually stick on board. And again, especially if it's turn five or later or the five resource turn or later, getting to shield it up afterwards kind of helps to just stabilize the board there for you. So I'm a big fan of that card. Rose, we've already talked about for some of just the crazy shenanigans that Rose can do. I have three copies in this list because it really can get that busted, especially with the Luke leader unit coming out, protected by an Obi-Wan. You can really start comboing with getting some shields on units, using Rose Tico to buff them just to absurd stat lines. Rose is fantastic. I usually like to use Energy Conversion Lab on Rose when possible. Rose not having Restore though makes it hard sometimes, but usually it's just such good stats that it's totally worth it. Lastly, I do have two copies of Bright Hope in this list. I actually don't think the stats are super strong on this, and this is where I'm really missing out on having a wing leader in this list. Being able to buff this to a 4-8 with that rebel tag is fantastic. However, bounties are just so prevalent right now in this new set that Bright Hope just helps with that. You can bounce back your unit that they just put all of their bounties on, and those bounties just get discarded. They don't trigger, that unit comes back to your hand, you get to draw a card still, which card draw on this deck is just a running theme to always have options available to play, which is great. So usually what I like to do is attack with that unit, let them put a couple bounties on it, and then just bring it right back up with a Bright Hope. This also works great with the Alliance Dispatcher to kind of get some card draw engines running, especially if they've popped the shield on it already, or just play it as a 2-6 Sentinel. Um, it kind of serves 
serves the same purpose as the Dawn Interceptors of just a big Sentinel unit in space that they kind of have to deal with at some point. So not the strongest card in this deck list anymore since we took away a lot of that Rebel Synergy, but I still think it has enough value that it's worthwhile. Lastly, just want to talk about a few of the late game units. These are the ones that are really going to help you win the game. First up is just going to be Obi-Wan Kenobi, just a 4-6 Sentinel. Again, just keeps that theme, it buffs your units, it's getting your card draw, and it's a Sentinel that's going to stall out the board for you, getting into the late game. Again, playing Obi-Wan, bringing Luke out, attacking with Luke to give this a shield is just the combo pieces that really start working together. If you have a Rose Tico out, it is just a beautiful thing to see where you attack with Rose, make Obi-Wan a 6-8, kind of keep going from there. A lot of these combos kind of seem like they might be fantasy land, but there's so many things that are all kind of trying to do the same thing that eventually one of them will stick and will hit. So if you play a Rose and they're always like, I'm going to destroy that Rose at all costs, usually there's other opportunities for you to still be able to buff these units, protect them, get those heals going strong. Luke Skywalker is just such, such a staple in any blue hero list. That on, like when played ability is just too strong. Because you're going so wide on the board, you have plenty of opportunities for one of your units to get destroyed and then make that minus six, minus six come into a play. So a lot of times if I have a Battlefield Marine, I'll just run it into something to get it below that threshold, play Luke Skywalker, give it minus six, minus six. It's a nasty combo. Restore three on this helps you stabilize the board as well. This is a perfect thing that I want to give shields to, to kind of protect it. Definitely can be one of those just when you play it, you just kind of win the game on the spot kind of things. Lastly, just home one, you have just a ton of units that are pretty low to the ground, low cost that just you can bring out with home one. For free, you can bring out the Echo Base Defenders, the Dawn Interceptors. You can bring out Bright Hope for just an additional one cost because it reduces everything in a discard pile by one. Or if you do get to 12, 13 resources, which can happen with this deck list, sometimes you can bring out Obi-Wan or another Luke Skywalker. You don't have a ton of late game. These are really the three units that I would call late game style units. But home one is still just so fantastic in that late game, get a huge unit in space. Now everything's restoring just to help you really come over the top. Usually when I'm playing home one, that's when I just automatically become the aggressor and just start going face because they have to answer what you have going on. So those are all the units. I just wanted to talk through some of the events and upgrades that I have in this deck list as well. Uh, so first, just wanted to talk about the ramp strategy of this list. Usually in the last set, resupply was what we were trying to use. So I still have two copies of Resupply in here, but the newest set actually came out with a new card just called Spark of Hope. And that just says, choose a unit in your discard pile. If it was defeated this phase, put it into play as a resource. This card can feel like it's a dead card if you're not playing appropriately, but I have not had any issues using Spark of Hope. You have 13 cards that you can play on turn one, and a lot of them you could just kill turn two. Uh, you can make favorable trades in, feed your unit, turn it into a resource, and you're off to the races. The reason I love Spark of Hope more than Resupply, even though it has that little caveat of you have to have a unit that was destroyed for it to work, is usually I want to ramp when I'm at five resources so I can go ahead and deploy loot. And a lot of the units I'm wanting to play on that turn cost three already. So with the two costs of Spark of Hope, it allows me to play both the ramp card and the three cost unit, then deploy Luke, protect that unit, and then start getting some combos rolling from there. Resupply is still good. It's still a great turn to play, especially against control matchups. You want to ramp as quickly as possible. And that's actually where Spark of Hope can sometimes feel like a dead card. Uh, if they're not clearing your board for whatever reason, it just can be a little bit trickier if you don't have things you can trade into. So if they kind of know what's happening, they can play around your Spark of Hopes a little bit better. But I think the way to beat control, which we'll talk about a little bit more in depth, is to be able to ramp, get to your late game, start really whittling down their board and their base total as quickly as you can. Last thing in the sideboard is just two copies of the Marauder. Um, there's a lot of space heavy decks right now. Triple Dark Raid is an insane card that I think is only going to continue to get stronger and people are going to look to really capitalize on. And so the Marauder is in the sideboard because it's a space unit with ambush. It's going to clear so many of their units that they're playing in space that you want to get rid of. And it's win played ability says choose a card in your discard pile, put it into play as a resource if it shares a name with a unit you control. So you're already trying to build up a wide board state, playing the Marauder, getting to bring back another Battlefield Marine, uh, put it into your resource pile is great. Um, when that hits, it's fantastic. I think you're more so using this card to use its ambush ability to just clear a space unit though. If you get the whole thing, great. 
it doesn't need that much value for it to still be good. And when I put the Marauder in, it's usually just a direct swap for resupply since it's kind of serving the same purpose of ramping. But again, this is strictly used against space heavy decks uh, because you're pretty low on the total number of space units. You have a lot of good Sentinel things in space, but to kind of fight back and destroy those key units. When they're attacking into you, they're getting to make those favorable trades. If you're attacking into it, you're the one able to really determine like what gets to stay on the board. And so that's why I do like the Marauder in the sideboard, uh, but just two copies of it. So, so a lot of the removal package is actually gonna be in the sideboard for this list. We do have three copies of Rival's Fall to start out. I really just like the value of this card. You're already ramping, so getting to six, seven resources isn't super, super difficult. And the honest answer is Boba Fett with some armor is just disgusting. You don't really have great ways to deal with that with our current list. And so three copies of Rival's Fall, allows you to deal with that. There's a lot of, yeah, just late game units or yeah, your opponent will play. This just clears them off the board. You don't have to think twice about it. And at six resources, it is a lot, but where the top end of your units are six, seven, eight, you can usually play Rivals Fall on another unit and be totally fine. So this is another one that I'm pretty quick to actually sideboard out against aggressive matchups in particular. Rivals Fall is going pretty quickly uh, just because paying six to get rid of one unit is just typically not worth it. But uh, in a lot of the control matchups and the mid-range kind of mirror style, we're both constantly going back and forth with who's the attacker, who's the defender. I think Rivals Fall has a lot of play in those as well. So it's in my main list. And the sideboard though is where I have a lot of the answers. And this is where it really helps to know what is your opponent playing and how can you counter that? So I have three copies of Make an Opening to start with. This is perfect against Yellow Villain. It defeats the Lurking Tide Phantom where other cards just can't because you can't deal damage to it. You can't just defeat it. However, if you remove its health and it has zero health, it dies on its own. And so Make an Opening and Luke Skywalker both can kill those space units on play. So I really like having three copies for that reason. Also just against aggressive lists in general, giving something minus two, minus two typically kills the unit. Healing up for two is great. It's a little bit slower than like playing a Yoda and attacking in with it. I still think it's worth bringing in. Against those aggressive lists, I usually just sub Rivals Fall out or Home One out because it's just such late game and bring Make an Opening in. Takedown, I have two car copies of this card. Takedown, I haven't played with a whole lot in this list. However, it's just such a good staple card in blue in particular, where you're already making a lot of trades. You have so many two drops, three drops that are attacking for three, four attack. A lot of times you can just trade in one unit and then play Takedown to destroy their giant thing. So Rivals Fall is doing the trick a lot of times, but if they're really ramping hard and getting a lot of those late game units out there, bringing in Takedown as well as Rivals Fall can just help you keep up with their late game pressure. And lastly, I just have one copy of Take Captive. Capturing just is really strong in this list. Initially I had Traitorous, but I just recognized there was so much upgrade hate in play right now that it was hard for me to justify playing a Traitorous. And so we'll talk about that as well for some just other options for this deck. For me, Take Captive just gets the job done. So it says a friendly unit captures an enemy non-leader unit in the same arena. So even if you have a little 1-1 Maz Kanata, you can play Take Captive and capture their Crate Dragon. You lose three health for playing it, but it doesn't have to be a stronger unit, which a lot of those kind of cards will say on there. And so it doesn't quite fully remove the card, but for three, you're usually able to play so much else on that turn that it can just kind of help you stabilize your board, take over the advantage that way. As well as if you have the initiative, you play this turn one, even if they kill your unit, it's exhausted. So if you're already willing to spend two to exhaust the unit, spending three to just clear it off the board for the time being, and maybe you're able to stabilize the board, protect that unit, keep it alive for the rest of the game, can just help you come over the top. So this is more just like a cheeky tech option that I wanted to put in this list for some removal packages there. All right, lastly for the rest of the card list here, we just have some reach options. So a lot of these units, they don't attack for a lot. They have two help, two attack, three attack. Maz Kanata is able to keep getting stronger. Rose Tico is able to buff a lot of the units, but we wanted to see like, what are some ways that we can come over the top? And so for me, the forces with me is just such a great card for that. It gets two experience on the play and you get to attack with that unit. If Wing Leader was already a pretty good card in most of the lists that were using any sort of rebel synergy that was just giving two experience, this card is doing that and you get to attack right away. So usually they're just playing around what they see on board 
getting to buff your unit, attack in, destroy their thing, keep your unit alive is fantastic. When you have a force unit out, the extra shield is definitely nice, but I don't think it's necessary. You're really just saving a few points of damage, which again, can come into handy, can protect you against Tarking Town and things like that. I think it's really good when you get the shield. However, I don't think it's totally necessary for the sake of winning the game. One play I do like though, is having a force unit out, playing the forces with me on Rose, attacking with Rose, getting the plus two experience for the forces with me, destroying the shield that it gives you, giving another plus two experience for destroying that shield, and now Rose is attacking for an additional four if you're attacking at their base, which can just win you the game on the spot a lot of times. So really like the forces with me, that's why there's three of in this list. U-Wing is just such a staple in Command Heroism deck lists. In this list in particular, you're wanting to play Mas Kanata, you're wanting to play two three drops, a two and a four, you can play Obi-Wan with it. You're more than fine playing Luke Skywalker if you just need that unit and you haven't drawn any yet. Since you have three, you can typically find one. Just a lot of options, a lot of things that you can play around. You can get those sentinels that you need in the ground or space side of things. Ewing is just such a fantastic card, absolute staple in this deck list. And then lastly, I do have a couple of lightsabers in this deck. So I have one copy of Luke's lightsaber. It's not one that I think is totally necessary, but I do think it's one that can just help you win the game. So three damage from hand, typically they're not expecting extra damage from your units. It comes into play and does a lot of great things. You don't have to play this lightsaber on Luke for it to have a lot of value. If you do, it's great. If you're able to attack in with the Luke leader, put the lightsaber on it afterwards to heal it, give it a shield, you're feeling great. But even just the plus three plus one for two is really solid in a lot of plays. Again, your opponent's not really expecting you to have a lot of extra damage from hand. This can kind of help surprise them. That's why I have one copy of Luke's lightsaber in the main board. I also have two copies of the Jedi lightsaber in the sideboard. I think we do have enough force units that it's worthwhile. We have Yoda's, we have Kanan, we have Obi-Wan, Luke Skywalker unit and leader. There's a lot of ways to buff those force units with this lightsaber. And that on attack to get to give minus two, minus two to just clear their board uh, is really strong. So it's in the sideboard right now because I just do think upgrade hate is so prevalent that it's really hard to justify keeping this in the main list. However, if you notice that they don't have that upgrade removal, this is a great card to kind of slide in. Quill is a great one to probably take out if you wanted to go that route to be able to buff those forced units. Or again, even just give plus three, plus three to something that can make a great trade or just win you the game on the spot. All right, lastly, just Energy Conversion Lab. Just wanted to give a very quick conversation about this card as opposed to just using a 30 health base. You are losing five health by using the Energy Conversion Lab. I hope as I talk through some of the plays with Rhodes, with Kanan, even just some of the early game options to clear their unit out, keep your unit alive, can kind of justify why Energy Conversion Lab is stronger than the 30 health base. You also just have so much healing in this deck that that extra five health, you basically don't even notice it. It's kind of, if they were gonna get to 25, they were gonna get to 30 because they cleared your board and are coming over the top. It's very occasionally hurt me in the aggressive matchup, specifically against like Sabine or Double Red Kylo. They're just trying to get you down to zero as quickly as possible. That's when you really need to try to mulligan hard to get some early making openings or cards that have restore on them to kind of stabilize your board that way. But again, Energy Conversion Lab in those matchups is also great. Getting to ECL out like your Yoda, restore to destroy their MIGs or another unit that only has two health can really just stabilize that board quickly. So this card still feels feels incredibly powerful in this deck list and really is um, the justification for trying to even just make this build. So big fan of Energy Conversion Lab. I don't think I would consider the 30 health base here. Lastly, I just wanted to kind of go through a few different game plans and then some other options you could look at for your deck list. These are gonna be very rough ideas for the archetypes in general. Every deck leader essentially is gonna be trying to do a few different things. So it's hard to go through every single one that you could possibly see. The more reps you get on this deck list, the better you're gonna be able to counter the specific leader. So these are more overarching ideas for what you're trying to do. Uh, so first up is just against aggressive lists. You want to win the board. If they have the board state and are able to swing with three units in a turn, you're gonna lose that game almost every single time. So getting things with huge stats out early, they're able to make favorable trades, keeping both space and ground units out as best as possible so they can't just lane dodge you is really important. I'll typically mulligan pretty hard for either early restore units or if it's a deck list that I know has a lot of space for the Dawn Interceptors in particular, the making openings are fantastic to kind of help clear the board out as well. You just want to keep your base as close to full health for as long as possible. You'll eventually take over the board. It's just a matter of do they have any 
anything else on their board at that stage. The thing I do like about this list in particular with the restore options is usually when I play against Sabine, I'll finally win the board, but I'm at, you know, 22 damage on my base and they're able to play for a cause I believe in and just win the game that way. The moment that I would kind of stabilize and start turning the tide. And so with the restore options, you're able to stay much lower to where when that crux point hits, you're actually able to come over the top and win. So again, you're healing with as much restore as possible. This is one that I'm much more willing to use some of my restore units for ECL. So the Yoda, the Kanan, sometimes even the restored arc if it's able to kill a 2-2 unit in space to go ahead and restore a little bit, clear out their unit. I think that's typically better than trying to maximize like stat value. So like trying to do the rose play or something else like that. But usually attacking in with restore and getting to heal with that, I think is typically a little bit better. And lastly, just as you're looking to sideboard for games two and three, make an opening is usually fantastic against these aggressive play styles. And I do think takedown is worthwhile. Rivals Fall is one that I'll take out very quickly. Trying to pay six to get rid of one of their units is just way too slow. You're gonna lose that game. Takedown can usually get rid of a lot of these leaders the moment they deploy. So they play their Sabine, you just take it down before they can play um, the Darksaber on it. They play Kylo, they're trying to clear out the rest of their hand before they attack with you. Takedown just gets rid of it very quickly. Like I said, I only have two copies of Takedown because it can be a little bit slow in some of these matchups. However, specifically with their leaders or a leader or a unit that they're trying to buff, I do think Takedown still has some value in here. So I would typically sub those two out for Rivals Fall and Home One. Home One's great. You're never gonna get to the eight resource turn in a way that you could actually play Home One. So I just think it's better just to take that out, play a little bit of a smaller resource list, try to win the board that way. Next up is mid-range. And this was the hardest one to try to analyze and talk about because every mid-range list is trying to do something different. So this is where you are really at an advantage if you know what your opponent's trying to do and able to capitalize that. It's always understanding like, when are you supposed to be the aggressor trying to go and just destroy their base? When are you supposed to be the defender and soak up that damage, soak up those hits and then fight back? Understanding that mentality is really key in these mid-range versus mid-range matchups. I would call loot green like a mid-control style. It definitely doesn't bleed into the control where you're just like totally able to just stall, stall, stall win at the very end you're keeping consistent pressure up. And so against these other mid-range lists, again, it's just really important that you understand when are you supposed to be the one kind of pushing your agenda and when are you actually stalling a little bit. I'd say Boba Fett's probably one of the toughest matchups you can have. That's why I do just love three copies of Rivals Fall. That's why I like three copies of Make an Opening to clear a lot of those uh, shielded two health units. I do think your late game can typically be a little bit better than Boba Fett's, however, like I said, the Fett's Fire Spray coming in, uh, getting to use the armor on the Boba Leader. There's so many options they have. Zuckus is a crazy card for a five cost six, six with Saboteur. They have a lot of options for sure. So it's probably one of the hardest matchups in my opinion. However, I do think it's still very winnable. Um, it's just gonna require just very tight play from you and understanding like, what are the exact trades you need to be doing to come over the top? So again, knowing the specific deck your opponent is playing, so crucial playing around that. If you see a red ray, like I said, they're probably playing pillage, they're probably playing force throw. Make sure that you are strategically playing around those cards. Perfect example is I had two cards in hand, they had at least four resources up. I could have played Ewing Reinforcement. I chose to try to make a favorable trade instead, and they immediately played Pillage to get it out of my hand. If I just would have played the Ewing first, maybe it wasn't the most advantageous thing on the board, but I was just too greedy there. Also, just sideboard is very matchup dependent in the mid-range versus mid-range matches. Again, just kind of understanding like what are they trying to do that is stronger than what you're bringing to the table, and what are those cards that you have that just maybe aren't doing the maximum value. Uh, again, Quill is a great example of a card that usually is one of the first ones I'm sliding out. It's great for a turn one play, has a lot of good things that it can do, but your sideboard is to help answer a lot of those questions that they're kind of bringing to the table. And then lastly, I just think try to keep as much of the late game as possible for those win conditions. You're trying to figure out like, okay, how can you do the unfair thing first by playing the Ewing, by playing the Luke Skywalkers, the home ones, to get that board state to a place where you can just swing in and win. So trying to keep those options available is great. Uh, usually if I have two or three of them in my opening hand, I'll mulligan it back. It's very tricky to try to play around. Um, this is where not having tech in the list or not having good smokel cards can sometimes hurt, but that's usually how you're gonna come over the top and win at the end of the game is by keeping hold of those, playing them at the right times. 
Lastly, I just want to talk about the control archetype as a whole. I actually think loot does really well against control, specifically against the ones that are just trying to clear your board, play the Vigilance, play the Avengers, all of those pieces to just eventually win. This is where I think if Supreme Leader Snoke comes into play and is a staple, I think Luke goes way down the list for viability because just that on play minus two minus two can just clear the board a lot of times. But my general strategy against control when I'm playing against it is you want their one for one trades to be advantageous for you. So they're playing the power of the dark side, they're playing the waylay. A lot of times on their turn, they're able to kind of do one thing or get rid of one thing and then hope that you're not able to like go wider on the board. Where Luke is able to go very wide, their deck can struggle a lot of times. I think the key piece though is playing around super laser blast. And that's why I say I always try to keep a Ewing reinforcement for that play. If they have blue villain whatsoever, you know they have super laser blast in that list. They're wanting to play it, then play their leader and kind of get the make that their swing turn to start pushing their advantage. So if you're able to build up enough of a board state where they feel like they have to use it, but then immediately follow it up with your Ewing reinforcement, you just win the game almost on the spot because they wasted their entire turn and you were able to recycle and kind of get your feet back under you. So a lot of times if they're playing the Vigilance strategy, I will win the game when I have zero cards in my deck. However, with the board state, I have enough things that have Restore on them to where that six damage each turn isn't doing a whole lot. And I'm usually trying to keep as many just cards back in my hand that can kind of come over the top and win the game. So I'll try to have a hand state of five, six plus cards that even if my deck is out, I'm still able to kind of recycle and keep playing things. So you don't want to just like hand dump if you're playing against control. You want to be very strategic with always keeping answers in your hand and always having ways to kind of recycle I and mean, keep the ball rolling there. But I think control's not the hardest matchup, especially if you're able to ramp early, get the Luke leader out, start putting that damage onto base. You're not complete aggro in those matchups but you're always wanting to try to think like okay how can I at least put a few more damage points on their base to where they're really struggling or have the point where they're one attack away from dying and usually you can come over the top and win this lastly just want to talk a little bit about those combos that we're looking at again this is why this deck is so fun we have the rose tico ecl combo specifically on that five resource turn i think is so nasty getting a four eight for four resources is crazy stats and then getting to use the luke ability to give it a shield again just keeps that train rolling that's so good lastly just the ewing combo with maz Kanata. Uh, if you already have maz out playing three units just buffs it to huge stats already, but also, yeah, just getting to play it first with Ewing and then two additional units to where it's a 3-3 for one is really good stats. Again, I've gotten this thing to like a 13-13 stats and just wins the game on the spot. Your opponent will do some very silly things to try to get rid of Maz just for the sake of not letting it just come over the top and beat you in those second and third games. It's so much fun. Lastly, I did have just so many cards that I was considering for this deck list. I just wanted to go through a few of the options really quick rapid fire before we kind of close this out. Just so as you're playing this deck list, you can kind of see what works for you. And I would even just love to hear what have you been trying this work, but maybe hasn't. But these are 11 cards, which I know is a ton that I was considering that I think you should also consider putting in your list. So first one's gonna be Timely Intervention. This is a card that just allows you to ambush your units out. You're already using Energy Conversion Lab, but there's a lot of units that you would like to be able to ambush, get that restore on, use the Rose ability on. Also does work for the late game cards. So you're able to use this with Luke Skywalker with Home One, where ECL typically wouldn't trigger with that. Um, and the fact that you can just resource this card and smuggle it out for two, usually you have so many resources in the late game that spending an extra two to get that ambush is totally worth it. This is a card I for sure want to test and kind of see what would I take out to make that card work. Akbar is another great, just kind of a removal option that also gets a unit on board. The reason I took it out was because it's a rebel synergy card where I don't have rebel synergy. And so I just felt like Akbar was probably a little bit too slow for what I was trying to do. However, if you wanted to go more of the rebel route, you totally can. And I would probably bring Akbar in. Maybe consider doing that over Yoda as an option. I just currently like Yoda's ability to draw your card and restore for a little bit more than Akbar, but it's still great. Uh, Fleet Lieutenant I put in here, but you could also put Wing Leader into the slot as well. Again, Rebel Synergy is fantastic. If you wanted to try to just put in Maz or just try to put in Rose Tico, keep the Rebel Synergy so it's clean, synergistic, 
you totally can. Fleet Lieutenant's a busted card. I think you can totally go that route if you want. I just wanted to try something a little bit different from that that gave me a few more options um, to stabilize in both the ground and space arenas. Card that I had in this list for a long time was Sundari Peacekeeper. That's a 1-5 with Raid 2 and Restore 2. So it's attacking for 3, Restoring for 2. Pseudo 3-5 for 3, which is like the great stats that you're looking for. However, this card doesn't punish your opponent for attacking back into it. With it only having one attack on its own, they're usually able to clear it pretty quickly. And you have a ton of three costs in this deck. And so I just felt like it was a little too slow for what you're trying to do. Five health is great and it's able to stay on the board for a while, but it's kind of just a vanilla restore option where I think some of the other cards just do it a little bit better. I'd rather have the Sentinel, I'd rather have Yoda's restore two with the card draw ability as well as the potential force synergy. This card just kind of barely didn't make it just because there was too much in there at three costs. Tech is one that I haven't tried either, but I definitely want to try it alongside Timely Intervention. It's a card that you can smuggle out for four, and then it turns all of your resource cards into cards that can be smuggled. So it just costs a little bit more to do that. However, having options is the name of the game for this deck list, and Tech is a card that just lets you have infinite options available to you. It's also a heroism card, so you can use the Luke ability to give it a shield, keep it alive a little bit longer. Every game that I've played against a Tech, that is the first thing that I want to kill. And so having this in your list I think could really benefit uh, what you're doing. Again it's just a three cost card and there's already so many three costs in this list. It just felt like it was too much to try to mess with at this time. However, I would definitely consider reevaluating your list, maybe going a little bit more late game options, and maybe potentially putting tech in there as something to where you always just have something available to you. Especially if hand management is a play style that comes in a lot with the Spark Rebellions, with the Pillage, the Force Throws, all of those things. Um, I really think Tech could be a great answer to those kind of play styles. Fell the Dragon is just a great removal card on its own. A lot of things are wanting to get buffed really strong. Against Boba, it kills the Fets Fire Sprite. It kills the Zuckus. For me though, I recognize I was having more issues with leaders that became way too powerful and way too strong. And Rival's Fall just does just kills it on the spot. It has nothing attached to it. It just costs two more. And where I'm ramping, I'm usually okay to pay that. And then takedown, I just felt like was a little bit more consistent with just being able to trade one unit in, take it down, and just play that way. So for me, that's why Fellow of the Dragon's not in this list. However, I think it's definitely worth considering as an option. Uh, Vigilance is just a staple in so many blue lists that are going to go a little bit more control. Trying to pay six for this just to heal or shield, you're definitely not going to be a mill strategy kind of deck. You're winning with value and board control. Getting the shield on this and healing five seems fine. It's one that I would consider it just is taking away from some of the ramp opportunities. So I think I would have to look at going less in the ramp style and more into just the pure value uh, to heal, to shield, take advantage of those things. Discerning Veteran is a, another just great capture card. Um, it's just a five cost three, four. It says when played, this unit captures an enemy non-leader ground unit. But there's just a lot of late game units that are really powerful right now that I think this card just does a great job just to control the board a little bit. It's not a heroism card, so that's why it's currently not on my list. However, I definitely would consider it. I don't think it's absolutely crucial to get the Luke ability on this card for it to be good. But a shield on this is great to try to keep it alive longer so that that capture card almost just becomes a card that you completely took out. And the same thing, Steadfast Battalion is one that's not currently in the list, but I think it could be. You're not a deck that's really trying to go super aggressive though, so getting that Overwhelm or like that 7 damage to their base, you typically don't need that level of just raw stats to do that. However, it's just a great value. It kills Boba when Boba comes down, if you have your leader Luke out. Luke, as a leader though, does die pretty quickly, so it was hard for me to justify putting the Steadfast Battalion in the list as something that you couldn't shield with its ability, except for when you have Luke already out. So that gave it some points, but maybe not all of it. Definitely still consider putting it in your list. Last few cards, Traitorous, we talked about a little bit. I subbed in Take Captive for the Traitorous, but Ray is a list that's really popular right now where they're buffing Yoda like crazy. They're getting those Moisture Farmers to three sevens, I believe, as well as the two two shielded sentinel units to three threes and a lot of the space units as well. So having a trader is available, I think is really good specifically against Ray. I personally haven't had too bad of an issue beating Ray lists. It's usually a tough fight, but usually you can come over the top and win um, against Ray. So I think if, if Ray lists really start getting like 
problematic, I would consider it. Trader Salsa does steal the Lurking Thai Phantom if you're playing against like a yellow Tarkin list, which is kind of funny. You let them buff it up like crazy and then you just take it for yourself and then say, okay, you try to deal with this thing. Very funny, but again, there's just so much upgrade hate right now that I think Traders is a little hard to justify. And then lastly, I just had one copy of Redemption in this list for a long time. Just a giant Sentinel space unit uh, that you're playing at eight. I just felt like home one is a little bit stronger. And it felt like most games, when I had it in my list, I didn't need that much late game to come over the top. So if it ever gets to the point where I feel like I need to really hold tight to my late game cards, have as many options available, am I considering slotting one of those in again? But usually you just have so much restore in this deck already that you don't even need it. So that's my version of Loot Green. I really think it's a powerful deck. I've had a lot of success with it, playing against some friends locally, a lot online as well, which you can take that for as you will for just the strength of gameplay that you get for the online play. But yeah, this deck has a whole lot of options, answers, removal, buffs. Again, you always feel like you have multiple things you can do on a turn, and for me, that is the place to help. I just love. So let me know how you've built this deck. Let me know some things that you would change, what you would take out, maybe some of these possible additions that you say, Jim, you're an idiot, you need to put that card in there right away. I would love to just hear, yeah, how you're building this deck. Right now, this is my front runner to bring to Gen Con. I just think it just has a lot of play. Not many people are on it, so it just has a little bit of a surprise factor still, which I'm excited about. But yeah, let me know in the comments what you think. See ya.